Are you hungry enough to devour every sentient being in the entire galaxy? Well, today let's talk about just that and go over the Tyranid Hive fleets in 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're here for a Tyranid video. When you're collecting Tyranids, one of the bigger decisions that you can make is which Hive fleet your swarm is going to hail from. So in this video, we'll talk through the history, battle tactics, and in-game use of each Tyranid Hive fleet. So let's jump straight in and sort our Gorgons from our Hydras and our Behemoths from our Leviathans. So first up, let's look at the original first incursion into the galaxy with Hive Fleet Behemoth. This blue and red carapist Hive Fleet led the first incursion into the galaxy and helped name the entire Tyranid race when they utterly destroyed and consumed the Tyranid outpost on Tyran. High Fleet Behemoth had no subtlety and was an absolute hammer blow that just ravaged straight into Imperial space, consuming all on its path, focusing all of its might into one great hammer blow that headed straight for the realm of Ultramar. The unstoppable reign of Tyranid vessels consumed many systems, including Thandros and the Orcs of Jagger, before coming into full contact with the Ultramarines forces in the Battle of Prandium, where it was revealed that the Codex Astartes was woefully inadequate for dealing with the Tyranid menace. Despite the best efforts of Marnius Kalgar and Inquisitor Crickman, the marines were brutally beaten back and Prandium was utterly devoured, the jewel of Ultramar being no more. In this post-Prandial state, the Tyranids advanced on Macrag, where they were finally halted by the Ultramarines chapter, despite the assault on the Polar Fortresses claiming the lives of every single veteran of the Ultramarines' first company. Only that by the ultimate concentration of Imperial forces and the sacrifice of the veterans of one of the greatest chapters of the Imperium was the Behemoth eventually stopped. The battle tactics employed by High Fleet Behemoth were distinctly unsubtle, favouring uncomplicated and costly if direct assault, using numbers and sheer ferocity to overwhelm enemy positions and feast on the defenders. Typically, they're one of the most melee orientated Tyranid Hive Fleets, employing many Hormigaunts and Carnifexes in a direct assault on enemy positions. In game, High Fleet Behemoth rerolls charges, always handy for the more melee focused Tyranids, getting a bit more reliable melee engagement is rarely a bad thing. Their new unique psychic power is really quite a powerful one, giving one unit plus one to wound in melee, really potent on big gaunt or gene stealer swarms. Their warlord trait and relic both are small damage buffs, the relic for monstrous scything talons for a hive tyrant, and their stratagem can give them the chance for some mortal wound impact hits, though honestly I don't think it's the strongest one. Overall I'd say they're fairly moderate in strength, not completely useless, but not one of the stronger hive fleets at the moment. If you like close combat ferocious tyranids, perhaps playing in the most archetypical way for their race, then perhaps Bear Moth might be the swarm to embody. Next up we come to the second Hive Fleet to ravage Imperial space, Hive Fleet Kraken. After the Bear Moth struck, massive amounts of Imperial forces were built up in the galactic southeast to better resist any threat should the tyranids return. It seems that the Hive Mind had developed many new strategies though, following the first incursion of Bear Moth, and the tendrils of Hive Fleet Kraken were far more insidious. Swathes of gene stealer cult rebellions rose up in many of the most important fortress planets, and only when the defenders were fighting themselves did the Kraken strike. Rather than an all or nothing hammer blow of High Fleet Behemoth, the tendrils of Kraken struck at many places simultaneously, making it impossible to contain the High Fleets all in one great battle, and leading to countless worlds being devoured. Both the Lamenters and the Sides of the Emperor chapters were utterly gutted, and the proud Eldar of Iandin spurned the warnings of Eldrad Ulthran and engaged a major Kraken fleet directly, leading to the utter ruin of their craft world, and dooming them to rely on ghost warriors for forever more. Again, it was Marnius Kalgar and the Ultramarines who led a combined force at Ikar 4 to break the back of the High Fleet, the veterans of the previous Tyrannic War being indispensable experts in fighting these Xenos foes. Still though, due to the spread out nature, many splinter fleets of Kraken remain, and the Eastern Fringe certainly isn't free from the predations of the Tyranids. In battle, the tendrils of Kraken are a fairly typical high fleet, but maybe with more of an emphasis on speed, hard-hitting tactics, and destabilising the foe's army at every turn. Their hammer blowers are placed far more strategically than Behemoth, and they make good use of gene stealers to sow havoc in the enemy's supply lines. In game, Kraken are one of, if not the most powerful high fleet right now. Their main adaptation is to be able to roll three dice for advances and pick the highest, and they can also fall back and charge. Again, this is absolutely great with any melee bogs. In particular, the boosted advance rolls are great with Onslaught, the psychic power that allows them to advance and charge, so some really long charges there, and of course Gene Stealers, who can advance and charge anyway. To double down on this, they even have a stratagem that allows them to double their advance, meaning that you can really send a missile of Gene Stealers all the way over to your opponent's deployment zone turn 1 should you want to. 
Their power is a bit more tame, allowing re-rolls of charges versus just one enemy unit. Their warlord trait allows them to pick one unit to fight first nearby, maybe a bit more passable. Though their minus one to hit at ranged relic can be quite good protection for something like a hive tyrant. Overall, hive fleet kraken are quite strong and are currently one of the most played hive fleets competitively at the moment. Next, we come to perhaps one of the biggest existential threats to the Imperium itself, Hive Fleet Leviathan. Hive Fleet Leviathan is the third great Hive Fleet to incur in Imperial space, notable not just for its sheer size, but also the intelligence and cunning of its Hive commanders, and more advanced adaptable bioforms that can be used to lay low near any foe. Where Bear Moth and Kraken have both struck on the eastern fringe, Leviathan is approaching from below the galactic plane, and splinter fleets have been found all over the Imperium. The experienced Inquisitor Cryptman has once again led the defence, strategically evacuating or even declaring exterminators on threatened worlds so as to deny the Leviathan biomass. The spectacular sacrifice in lives and personnel that this required led to him becoming exiled, though it has been somewhat successful in delaying the Leviathan, though it most certainly has not been truly stopped. The High Fleets have engaged the Orcs of the Octaria Sector, who have flocked to confront a worthy foe, leading to an enormous war between the Leviathan and the Greenskins, with the Imperium only looking on, knowing that whichever foe triumphs will likely emerge stronger and nastier. Both the Orcs and the Leviathan seem to be thriving on the endless conflicts pitted between them. An enormous splinter fleet has also laid waste to the Blood Angels' homeworld of Bar, leading to the near destruction of the Blood Angels and the majority of their successor chapters, only relieved by Gilliman and the Indomitus Crusade, and a rather timely incursion of corn demons that cut off the Tyranid supply lines. Nevertheless, more splinters and tendrils of Leviathan reach the galaxy all the time. It isn't known whether the bulk are already here yet, or if they are merely the precursors of a much larger swarm to come. In battle, the bioforms of Leviathan have combined sophisticated assault patterns at an incredibly sophisticated synaptic command web. Hive Tyrants and Swarm Lord pattern commanders are quite common within their ranks, and they seldom employ just one tactic to lay waste to their foes, combining hordes of chittering swarms, great gum beasts, and more mobile winged tyranids that strike from the skies. In game, Leviathan tyranids get a 6 plus feel no pain type save whenever they're near a unit that has synapse, so it can mean that particularly their larger bogs are far more durable than they'd normally be. Their stratagem is a combined assault one, getting B rolls if you have a flying unit near to a non flying unit when both are in combat, so it may be a little bit tricky to pull off but could certainly be possible. Their psychic power just extends their synapse range a bit, maybe a little bit unreliable for quite an important ability, and they have some relic monstrous bone swords and some re-rolls for a warlord traits. Overall, I'd say these purple carapace tyranids are moderate to strong in strength. The 6 plus fail no pain save is a very welcome durability boost, but I'm not sure it's quite top of the pack compared with a few other options. In any case, if you'd like to play the most sophisticated tyranids around, posing an existential threat to the entire of Warhammer 40k, then maybe Leviathan is for you. Moving on, we come to four of the lesser Hive fleets, not quite the same galactic spanning threats of the previous three, but nevertheless have laid waste to entire subsectors of the Imperium, and each have their own interesting fighting style and adaptations. First of these is Hive Fleet Jormungander, a resurgent lurking infestation of a Hive fleet that has been played Imperial worlds for centuries now. Often, the Hive Fleet Jormungander has been eradicated in great and costly battles only to rise from the depths of the planets that it was conquered from, a great worm striking from the deep to consume anew. The high fleets of Jormungander will typically employ a great barrage of asteroids and orbital debris, falling on a planet from space and fully laden with tyrannocytes and cysts, birthing a burrowing swarm of Morlocks, Trigons and Raveners down to infest the planet and undermine the enemy's defences, striking from below. Often a world will have been thought cleared of the Tyranids, only for a great incursion to rise from the depth, Trigons and Morlocks drilling a great tunnel for countless swarms to emerge from the planet's depths. With their tunneling natures, the Tyranids of Jormungander are quite a hardy lot. Any models without the fly keyword gain cover if they don't advance and charge. Really nice for any units that weren't planning on doing this anyway, things like ranged Tyranid critters, units like Exocrines, Hive Guard, and maybe even Tyranid Termagants will really like this. They also have a stratagem to allow you to set up another unit of infantry alongside units like Raveners, Trigons, or Morlocks. So if they really want to, they can capitalise on deep striking a ton of stuff at the same time. Could be a pretty nice way to unleash an absolutely enormous wave of termagants with devourers, perhaps. Their psychic power allows you to re-roll hit rolls for any Jormungander units set up on the battlefield that turn. Maybe a touch short-lived, but also quite fitting, I guess. Their warlord trait also plays quite well with ranged tyranids, granting them ignores cover to units within a small bubble. 
though their relic is a bit useless in a minus one leadership bubble. Overall, I'd say they certainly have their uses. Having some fairly good extra durability against range is no bad thing, though it maybe wouldn't help all that much if your units could get cover anyway, and of course only applies to certain units. Overall though, if you want an exceptionally hardy swarm striking from below the enemy and undermining them at every turn, then maybe the striking black and yellow tyranids of High Fleet Jormungander could be for you. Next up, let's move on to the venomous and adaptable tyranids of High Fleet Gorgon. Green-skinned tyranids with bone-coloured carapaces, these tyranids have been a constant scourge at the edge of the Tau Empire, initially beat them back when they attacked one of the Tau main sept worlds when the grey-skinned aliens combined forces with the Imperium in the face of a greater foe. With the conflicting ideologies of the empires though, this uneasy truce quickly broke down when there wasn't a uniting threat to keep them together, meaning that the Tau and Imperial forces never got round to hunting down and destroying the last of the Gorgon High Fleet when it fled the system. Perhaps from such constant exposure to fighting the Tau, High Fleet Gorgon have become incredibly adaptable. Their swarm functions as an ever-adapting arms factory, sometimes within the space of one battle, adapting and updating their venomous toxins to better suit the foe that they're fighting. A mere scratch from a wound of a tyranid of High Fleet Gorgon can be a signal of death, a foe's body bobbling down to a rancid gruel to be consumed at the tyranid's leisure. In battle, they employ many toxicrines, gargoyles, and venomous adaptations and toxin sacs on their more regular bioforms, and up close, each of their organisms is completely lethal. To represent this in-game, High Fleet Gorgon rerolls one to wound in melee, quite a nice generalised flat damage buff across all of their forces, though I'd still say it perhaps struggles to compete against some of the other adaptations. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a flat damage buff, it's quite simple and effective, though often I think it's more important that you actually make the charge in the first place, meaning that many other forces turn to armies like Kraken, Leviathan or Behemoth to either survive to make the charge or make the charge a lot faster. Otherwise, they've got a 1 command point toxin sack stratagem to make it work on a 5+, plus, not just a 6. Their psychic power, poisonous influence, gives them a 9-inch bubble of making their AP better by minus 1 in combat. That is really quite a nice one, and could be pretty good in combination with a big swarm of hormigants or something. Their trait and relic aren't amazingly good though, I think. Their warlord trait gives them a slight chance for mortal wounds in melee, and their relic will give the bearer a plus 1 toughness after taking a wound. I guess it's a bit of a durability buff if you're buffing up a hive tyrant to be toughness 8 rather than toughness 7, but it's kind of annoying that it won't have any effect for the first round of attacks. Overall, Gorgon perhaps don't seem to be one of the most commonly played, perhaps a slightly weaker hive fleet, though I'd say they certainly have their uses. Overall though, if you want a hyper-adaptive and thoroughly toxic Tyranid Swarm, the toxic horrors of High Fleet Gorgon might be for you. High Fleet Kronos are perhaps one of the ultimate manifestations of the nauseating Tyranid phenomenon known as the Shadow in the Warp. They're rumoured to be the High Fleet's answer to the forces of chaos, which is often an anathema to the Tyranids and denies them powerful biomass, and Kronos' psychic anathema banishes much of that chaos threat back into the realm of the Empyrean, leaving the mortal followers to be devoured on the worlds that they attack. The swarm seems to be drawn inexorably to psychic presences within the galaxy, whether that's hunting and destroying the forces of chaos, or appearing to devour a psychic distress beacon sent out by a desperate planet. They often show such a predilection for hunting psychers that they have been known to attack and destroy chaos fleets while completely ignoring imperial fleets that were battling them. In battle, they are quite an unorthodox force by Tyranid standards, having enormous presence of psychers and zonethropes, crushing the psychic presence of the lesser races beneath them. Their favoured tactics also seem to prefer ranged combat over melee, their advance being considerably slower than other Tyranid forms, weapon beasts and termagants destroying demon and chaos forces under a never-ending hail of living ammunition. In-game, High Fleet Kronos are one of the stronger ones by far, being pretty much the go-to for Tyranid ranged units. When the models are stationary, they get to re-roll hit rolls of 1, which is really quite a nice whole army damage boost, and it's particularly good for powerful ranged units like Hive Guard or Exocrines. Their stratagem is also very nice as well. The Deepest Shadow is one command point, and when you use this before an enemy casts a psychic power, they can only use one dice to manifest, not two. It can be really strong to foil an important psychic power, such as Warp Time or Eldar Doom or Jinx. Their psychic power can also buff shooting units, with one unit getting exploding sixes to hit, again great on Hive Guard. Their trait can further punish Psychers by causing failed psychic tests nearby to suffer d3 mortal wounds on the enemy. Really quite nice in combination with that stratagem. And their relic is a shooty one in a boosted Stranglethorn cannon. Overall, they add quite a big utility to the army, and it's often worth running your Tyranids with the shooty things as High Fleet Kronos as opposed to a different High Fleet. Overall though, if you like Tyranid ranged units, 
Neurothropes and Zonethropes, then Kronos might be a sinister and interesting way to play them. Lastly, for the main Hive Fleets, we come to Hive Fleet Hydra. This many-headed monstrosity has been following in the wake of Hive Fleet Leviathan and displayed some interesting cannibalistic behaviour, often showing up after a Leviathan strike has attacked and been repulsed, and devouring weary defenders and the remnants of the Tyranid Splinter Fleets alike. This cannibalistic behaviour is thought to allow Hydra to absorb the genetic memory and the lessons learned from the defeated Tyranid fleets, and dash the hopes of embattled defenders, thinking that they'd repelled the Tyranid horrors once and for all. Though a smaller high fleet compared with others, Hydra uses its biomass to field vast swarms of lesser organisms, in preference of bigger and more advanced creations. Their swarms of termagants, gargoyles and hormigons will strike as one great wave, overrunning and consuming the defenders where they stand. In game, these swarming instincts manifest themselves in re-rolling hit rolls in melee against a unit that has less numbers than the unit that's attacking. I would say it's perhaps a little bit on the niche side, perhaps most effective on things like gene stealers or hormigons, which are the biggest melee capable units that are likely to be overrunning the enemy. As a damage boost for them though, it is a fairly strong one. Their stratagem for two command points is Endless Swarm, it's designed to help you regenerate an infantry unit, but unfortunately the way it's worded you do need to pay reinforcement points for it, so it's not really that useful. Their power is a bit underwhelming to be honest, Death Shriek gives out mortal wounds when enemy units destroy your unit, but it's only really useful if your opponent's about to wipe out a big squad of gaunts in close combat. Their Warlord trait allows for a bit of wound regeneration, which isn't the worst, and their relic is some boosted Death Spitters that's available to the Winged Hive Tyrant. Overall, compared with the other Hive Fleets, they are rarely run. They're only really all that good with really big swarms of Tyranids, and it does seem that people tend to prefer other Hive Fleets when they're running those, whether it's Kraken for quicker charges or flexibility, or Kraken, Jormungander, or one of the custom ones for more durability, which tends to be the most important thing for Hordes, as they want to be claiming objectives. If you do just want to overrun the enemy with massively dangerous swarms of lesser Tyranid organisms, though, then Hive Fleet Hydra might be a good shout. Finally, lastly, if you do want to represent your own Tyranid Hive Fleet, then there is some option for building custom Hive Fleets. There are plenty of other smaller ones in the lore, and you could always make up lore for your own. A couple of the more interesting ones that I read about were Hive Fleet Tyamet, unusually protecting some verdant worlds where they appear to be constructing some great bioconstruct of uncertain nature. The psychic signal being produced by this is enormous, making Xenos Inquisitors suspect that it might be some great psychic beacon to draw yet more Tyranid organisms to the galaxy. They generally attack worlds almost to raid and carry the biomass back to their great work. Another one is High Fleet Ouroboros, which by some Imperial scholars is suspected to be the first Tyranids that ever reached the galaxy, but they weren't recognised at the time. Records of Millennium 36 detail horrors descending on the sky from an Imperial world, and the fact that their Tyranid bioforms appear to be ancient and cruder, far less adapted and sophisticated compared with the more current Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan, does lend weight to this theory. It does, however, mean that contemporary Tyranid fighting tactics are often ineffective against them. Ouroboros also seems to have a great preference for striking with winged organisms, gargoyles, harridans, harpies and shrikes, which descend upon high on the highest tiers of hive cities and block out the sun. For representing some of these custom hive fleets in-game, you can pick two hive fleet adaptations from a great big list. They do give you some different and powerful options, though it does mean that you miss out on unique relics, traits, stratagems and things for them, as they don't get those. To be honest, I think there are quite a few duds on the list, but there are some interesting ones. Perhaps one of the single best and most interesting is the Prey Side adaptation. It gives you plus one to hit for monsters when they charge, so that's really quite a solid damage boost for your biggest hitters. Otherwise, you can get a few hit rolls for each unit when they're near Synapse or Psyker units. Adaptive Exoskeleton is really quite a good one for Hordes, giving Termagants, Hormigants and Gargoyles a 6 plus invul save, and making them just that little bit harder to shift. There's one for re-rolling a failed Psychic Power per turn, and one to allow big critters to regenerate one wound at the start of each turn. Most of them depend on exactly what units that you're using, and there are plenty of other interesting ones too, but perhaps the ones I've seen most commonly used are the Prey Sight one for the critters, and the 6 plus invul for the swarms, if you're if you're just going for overwhelming numbers to hold down all the objectives. So let me know in the comments which is the best Tyranid High Fleet to play as and why. I certainly look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas, and I hope you've enjoyed a bit of a discussion of the swarms. If you'd like to see more videos like this, feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. Hopefully there will be a bit more Tyranid content in the future. Whenever their codex drops in 9th edition, I will certainly make a review. If you've enjoyed the videos on the channel and you'd like to help support and keep them coming, 
I would just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description. Making the videos does take a fair amount of time, so if you are enjoying regularly, any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few benefits, such as seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and also entry to the automatic prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.